agenda item. If you wouldn't mind turning off your cell phones or muting it, if you know if you're going to be tweeting, that's fine. Put it on mute, but just go ahead and uh, you know make them not heard. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the ever-evolving legal regime of privacy, which is a core issue for both Tech Freedom and Epic. Uh, when we launched Tech Freedom about a year and a half ago, it's actually going to be a year and a half tomorrow. Um, it was a central theme in the book that launched our organization, which we used, um, or rather, you, you can find that, that book, The Next Digital Decade, at nextdigitaldecade.com or any ebook store. So in that year and a half since our launch, um, technology policy really has been dominated by privacy. In March, the FTC came out with their final report, and as everyone here knows, it was kind of a long-awaited report. A month earlier, the White House put out their framework, which has brought wider legislative attention to these issues. Um, both kind of, you know, both the FTC final report and the, the framework really reflects larger concerns and the conversation that people are having about network databases, data collection and retention, governmental surveillance, and social networks. A slew of hearings on this issue have come about as a result and actually a number of our panelists have been on these hearings, so we're actually very excited about that. So today we're gonna to be doing something a little different. We're going to be debating the proposition that consumer privacy can be adequately protected without new legislation. Um, it really couldn't be a better time. The NTIA process kicked off um, this past week, and there are still serious questions as to the effectiveness of the process. So we may get into that, we may not, but still we wanna talk about this idea that consumer privacy could be adequately protected without new legislation. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator, who is Declan McCullough, chief political correspondent and senior writer for CNET, and has been talking about these issues for a number of years. Um, and, but before we get to that, I'd also say that if you have questions, please wait for the end, or direct them to our Twitter handle, which is at Tech Freedom. And also, the hashtag for tonight, or tonight, today, rather, is going to be Priv Debate. So P-R-I-V-D-E-B-A-T-E. -E. And of course, this will be videotaped and will be available shortly online at techfreedom.org. So with that, go ahead and turn it over to Declan. Well, thanks, folks, uh, for coming. And welcome to the great privacy debate at the National Press Club. And thank you for Tech Freedom and Epic uh, for uh, setting this up uh, and putting this together. I'll be your moderator for this event. That means I have to do my best to be studiously neutral, uh, which is not always an easy task for those of you who actually know me, and also hold each side to its allotted time. Uh, the proposition to be debated, I hope without any fisticuffs, uh, although that might make things more interesting, is consumer privacy can be adequately protected without new legislation. Now, social media is changing what we share with other people and how we share it. It's changing the way we think about privacy, what our expectations are. Uh, Andrew is critiquing this in his book that just came out called Digital Vertigo. He's saying that Twitter, LinkedIn, et cetera, uh, means that our privacy is sacrificed to the, uh, and I quote, utilitarian tyranny of a collective network. Sharing has become the new Silicon Valley religion, he says. Uh, Andrew's going to speak to this for six minutes. Uh, Adam, uh, to his left, uh, is a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, uh, and he'll have six minutes to respond to Andrew. Andrew um, Adam has written extensively about what he calls internet optimists and pessimists. I think he'll put Andrew in the pessimist camp, uh, and, uh, who, and Adam aligns himself with the optimist, calling himself a pragmatic optimist, and uh, called uh, Andrew's book in a Forbes piece uh, that Andrew is uh, the internet's supreme cyber grump. And so... Maybe we'll get some fisticuffs after all. Uh, but it's not just enough to talk about culture, because this is Washington after all, and folks here in the law and regulation business, and that brings me to Mark Rotenberg, who founded and runs uh, the Electronic Privacy Information Center and is the dean of DC privacy advocacy from a progressive, what he would call pro-consumer point of view. He's filed complaints about, uh, against Google, Microsoft, uh, Facebook, and others, and has six minutes to tell us why current laws are insufficient to protect consumer privacy. Uh, Barron is the founder and head of Tech Freedom, uh, which takes more of a pro-free market point of view and what Barron might call pro-progress point of view and is noticeably less enthusiastic uh, to, em or, uh, to embrace new laws and regulations. Um, when I interviewed Barron for a CNET article last year, he says that Epic simply doesn't understand why people want to share information. There are a lot of users out there who want to broadcast what movies they're watching. And once again, Epic is presuming to dictate what's appropriate for everyone else. And he has six minutes to respond to Mark. 
Then we move to cross-examination. Now, a Andrew and Mark will have 10 minutes to uh, divvy up among themselves to ask questions of Baron and Adam, and they will, they can require uh, Baron and Adam to answer, quest uh, answer their questions. I mean, think congressional hearings. They can reclaim their time if there's a filibuster, but hopefully with actual substance. Uh, then Baron and Adam get 10 minutes to respond, and we'll move to closing statements, six minutes per side. And one last point, let me tell you what this debate is not about. It's not about government surveillance and access by the government to your personal information. This is uh, no drones, no FISA, no warrantless wiretapping. These are important topics, perhaps even more important topics, uh, but these are topics for a future debate. We're just talking about consumer privacy here. Uh, this is not a conversation. This is a debate with each side having, uh, ha having a specific amount of time and the ability to cross-examination uh, or uh, lodge cross-examination questions at each other. I expect civility and will enforce that uncivil behavior will result in a time penalty. And uh, this means you, at, this means you, Andrew. And this is also not about running late. Uh, there is a 2.30 p.m. hearing on, in the Senate on facial recognition, and we'll get you out of here in time. So, gentlemen, the debate has begun, and Andrew, the floor is yours. Wow. Well, thank you. Um, so I, I, I liked uh, Declan's introduction. I am very much of a grump. It gives me great pleasure. Um, misery makes me happy. Um, I, I also was kind of amused by uh, Declan's uh, remarks about the cell phone. He said, turn your cell phones off, I turn mine off. But I just saw a piece in the New York Times, uh, an op-ed actually from earlier this month, that was about our cell phones and the, the two writers who uh, both uh, are experts on privacy from ProPublica uh, wrote, that's no phone, that's my tracker. So who here doesn't have a cell phone? So you've all got trackers on you. You've all got this device that is keeping tabs on everything you're up to from cheating on your spouses to not paying your taxes and various other naughty things I'm sure you're, or I hope you're all up to, although in DC, People don't cheat on their spouses in D.C., right? <laughs> anyway, so let me, let me begin. This is a big issue. I mean, maybe I'm making some jokes, but it is a very big issue. There's a wonderful moment in the movie uh, Social Network uh, where the uh, fictionalized version of uh, um, Sean Parker, the original president of Facebook, is getting very excited. He's at a party. They're taking lots of drugs, and they're all undressing. And he said, first we lived in villages, then we lived in cities, and now we live on the Internet. And I think that is the, the foundation, to excuse the pun, the platform that we need to work off today. The internet is not um, just another thing, just another device. It's not, uh, it's not um, something that we can escape. It's becoming the central platform, the edifice, what I call in my book, the architecture of life in the 21st century. It reflects our new knowledge economy. It's both a cause and a consequence of the breakup of the old industrial hierarchies of the 20th and 19th century. And the architecture, in my view, is why I wrote the book, Digital Vertigo, that's coming into place, is one of a panopticon. History is repeating itself. Um, in this piece in the New York Times, um, the, uh, another privacy expert remarked, um, don't have a cell phone or just accept that you're living in the panopticon. If you remember the historia, historical buffs, the panopticon was the all-seeing hospital or school or factory invented by Jeremy Bentham at the beginning of the industrial age, a place where we were being watched all the time. This new platform, this digital world that we have been thrust into, it doesn't mean that we choose not to be in it. I'm not suggesting that most of us are in it because we don't want to be. I'm in it. I like it. I'm as networked as anyone. I'm not against the technology. But I think the problem is, is that we're living in a world that is dramatically different from the one in the 20th, 20th century. It's a, it's a big data world, a world in which all the new players, whether it's Google or Facebook or Twitter, social location services like uh, highlight. They're all in the business of aggregating our data and selling it to advertisers. They're all in the business of uh, making themselves the new barons of this age by getting rich on our data. Technology moves much faster than politics. I'm afraid to tell you this. I mean, you're all DC people. I'm on the West Coast. And technology moves in infinitely faster. The challenge in DC, the challenge for legislators is to catch up with this, the challenge is to make sense of it and understand that this is a new, a dramatic world, in many ways as dramatic, as revolutionary as, as industrial society. 
as radical and dramatic as the way in which cities once replaced villages. In this new world, where we are increasingly defined by our data, where in five years there'll be 20 or 50 billion intelligent devices, where in five years we'll be wearing glasses put, put together by Google or some other company, where when we look at people we won't see smiling faces, we'll see data. In this new age, government needs to catch up. Government needs to understand that if it has any purpose, any value, it has to be able to legislate. That doesn't mean banning Google glasses or self-driving cars, but it does mean that the landscape has dramatically changed. That data is the new oil, and the consumer has become the product. That's why I use uh, Hitchcock's vertigo as a central metaphor in my movie. We, as citizens or consumers, we've become the fall guys. We're the ones who, when you sit around a poker table and you don't know who the person is who's going to lose, it's us. So what we need is government protection against the infinite speed of technology and technology companies and the way in which they're turning consumers into products. We need protection against these new data barons that are undermining our privacy, flattening publicness and privacy, and I think in many ways undermining what it is to be human. Is that enough? 90 seconds left. Um, it is a radical new world. It's a world which most of us can't and are not able to make sense of. I'm guessing that Adam will say that we choose to be part of this world. I'm guessing that Beren will say that we shouldn't be treated like children by government. But I think that's wrong. In the same way as in the middle of the 19th century, it would have all been too easy to say, well, stay in your villages. Don't go to the city. Don't work in factories. Don't become part of the industrial network. This new world, this digital world, is central to our lives, to our identities, to our communities, to how we network, how we build our own brands. So really, when it comes down to it, I think that consumers and citizens don't have any choice. Unless you are incredibly rich or incredibly poor, you can't afford not to be on the network. You can't afford to say no to these new data networks and platforms where we're building our brands and establishing our communities. And in that sense, then, government has a responsibility to legislate, not aggressively, carefully, not suggesting draconian laws, but I am saying that this is the fundamental political challenge of our age and government has to stand up or just go home and forget about it. Okay, uh, th uh, thank you. We have um, Adam, uh, you're up with, uh, I hope, a dissenting opinion. I think so. Uh, so thank you again uh, for having me here today. It's a real privilege. Um, my remarks are going to be basically condensed from a, a law review article I've written recently uh, entitled Techno Panics, Threat Inflation, and the Danger of a, uh, an Information uh, Precautionary Principle. Um, so basically, in response to Andrew's remarks, uh, what I'm gonna, the way I'm going to push back is to basically say there's really nothing new under the sun, and humans can adapt to the sort of challenges that he's identified. To do that, let me step back a bit and frame the way I think people and societies have often looked at new forms of technological risk to society. And I speak of technology very broadly, not just information technology, but all forms of technology. You can even go back to primitive forms of tools. How is it that we respond as a society or as individuals to new technologies? Well, in one end of the spectrum, you might place a sort of prohibitionary response, right? Get rid of it, ban it, censor it, limit it. Next to that, pretty close, would be anticipatory regulation, which would basically say let's find ways to, if not eliminate it, at least curtail its use or cabin its, uh, its, uh, its uses in society. Moving to the other end of the spectrum, you have what I would call resiliency and adaptation responses, which is basically finding ways to cope, finding coping mechanisms to learn how to deal with new forms of technological risk. Because I want to be clear, a lot of the concerns that Andrew raises in his book and that he just raised here today are quite valid. They're concerns I have every day as an individual and especially as a parent of two young digital natives who are out there trying to figure out this new world. And it's a challenging one and there are risks. But we do not or we should not respond to those risks with the heavy-handed top-down sort of approaches that Andrew hints at but never really gets clear in his book about how far he'd go. How far do you want to go to try to limit information flows to limit internet technology. We face this in many, many contexts today, 
And the four major areas of information technology policy, the ma four major fault lines, if you will, are free speech or public moral issues, privacy, which we're debating here today, copyright, and security. In every one of them, we face the same set of challenges, challenges of the scope and scale of the, the task in front of us, the sheer volume of what's going on, the very unique problem to our age of user-generated content, the fact that we divulge so much about ourselves or about others. These are unique challenges in the information age, but I'm confident, I'm optimistic, that we, when we use resiliency and adaptation-based strategies, we can find ways to adapt and cope with these new realities. Now, that doesn't mean just get over it. You sometimes hear that about privacy, right? Just get over it. No, I think that's silly and it's somewhat insulting. I don't say child safety, just get over it. That's crazy. What you need to do is to find coping mechanisms. Resiliency means basically you use education, you use literacy, you use empowerment, and yes, sometimes you use selective and targeted enforcement to address real legitimate harms. But that is the bottom-up approach to dealing with technological risks that societies face. It's the more constructive one because it allows innovation and progress to happen without the heavy hand of top-down internet government coming in and crushing all that we love about the information age. What we don't want to have happen in the world of privacy is the same things we don't want to have happen in the field of copyright or cybersecurity or child safety. We've been through this before. Again, there's nothing new under the sun. Everything that was wrong about SOPA for copyright, everything that was wrong about mandatory filters for, for porn, everything that was wrong about CISPA and things like this is wrong about the sort of approaches we're taking to regulating privacy. Information does want to be free in this new world, and we have to get used to the fact that that includes our personal information. We do need to take steps to try to better protect it, personal and corporate responsibility, the first order of business, but I would challenge my, uh, my others on this panel to, to, to find a way to do that in a bottom-up fashion and not through top-down information controls. Uh, thank you. Okay, and now we move to the lawyers. Uh, Mark, uh, can privacy be adequately protected, consumer privacy that is, uh, under the current legal framework, under current law, or do we need more laws such as the laws that Epic kind of pushes for? Uh, well, first of all, Declan, let me begin by uh, thanking Tech Freedom for organizing uh, the event with Epic, and thank you all for being here. I think it's a very timely uh, and important topic, and I'm, I'm very pleased for the opportunity to uh, speak with you. I want to begin to answer the question uh, in anticipation of what I think Barron is likely to say, that there are lots of partial solutions that may lead us to believe that we don't need new privacy legislation. And I am very familiar with these arguments because over the last 15 years, Epic has pursued a wide range of consumer privacy complaints at the Federal Trade Commission, and we have worked with commissioners who did not share our philosophy about how best to protect consumer privacy, but they did believe in the protection of consumer privacy. And this is my first key point, which is that I think we're all in agreement that we need to find a solution to this problem. Now, when we went to Chairman M M Muris a dozen years ago and said we need new privacy laws for the internet, he said, almost as Adam just said a moment ago, we don't want new government regulation. However, I do believe in enforcement, and we will enforce the current authorities we have. And we work with Chairman Muris within the framework of current law to enforce the rights of consumers. Later on, uh, we dealt with Commissioner Swindle at the Federal Trade Commission, who also did not believe in government regulation, but he was a big believer in private contract. And he said, listen, if a company has terms of service, if it tells its users in a privacy policy what it plans to do with their data, if it then accepts their data and then it changes their terms of service, Commissioner Swindle said that's breaking an agreement with the user. And we should go after companies that do that. He was a very big believer in private contract. And then uh, Chairwoman Majoris, who was the next uh, chair of the Federal Trade Commission, was a big believer in private property. And she said, you know, I don't like government regulation either. I'm not going to support sweeping new legislation. But if somebody else is putting some information on my computer, like a persistent tracker, and I don't know about it, and I don't agree to it, they have violated my property rights. And I don't want that to happen, and we will investigate companies that do this. So I'm actually, this afternoon for you, trying to fully make the argument 
on the other side against new legislation based on the view that there are other approaches that could help protect consumer privacy. I believe these are good arguments. And as I said, over the last 15 years, EPIC has worked with a variety of commissioners at the FTC under theories different than the ones we would have pursued to enforce consumer privacy rights. But they're not enough. They're not enough because for many of the reasons that Andrew just described, we are undergoing a fundamental change in how personal information is collected and used not only in the U.S. economy but in the information economy around the world. And this change is so fundamental and so pervasive that first of all, I think particularly people here would all acknowledge it. And I think also by implication, people here would say, we need to begin to find some new solutions. Now let me say a word about privacy solutions. There is always a temptation, I think, to engage in a bit of caricature. Adam talks about, you know, top down, heavy handed. We haven't heard bureaucratic yet, but I'm expecting that we'll to there. come. We'll get there. Um, you know, all of this, this is kind of scenery uh, for an argument. It's, it, it's decoration, right? It's not an actual substantive claim because it doesn't involve particular proposals that we would say, oh, that makes sense, that protects privacy, that gives, you know, clear notice to business, that helps markets, uh, you know, grow, or that doesn't make sense because it's tied to particular technology, it'll be quickly outdated, it doesn't provide protection to consumers, and it will confuse business. I mean, I think we can begin to talk about privacy proposals in terms of which category they fall into, what the characteristics are of good proposals, and what the characteristics of ones that I suspect we would all disfavor. Now, let's talk a bit about innovation as a basis, as a basis for comprehensive privacy protection. I'm willing to argue that if we turn back the clock a few years, we might agree that one of the most innovative people in the history of this country was a man called Benjamin Franklin, right? You've all read about Benjamin Franklin. But one of his interesting innovations that not many people may actually know about is Franklin was responsible for the emergence of the postal service, the Pony Express, in the new country in the latter part of the 18th century to facilitate the mails. Absolutely vital, a communication network for the new country. And what was Franklin's almost immediate insight about the value of this new service? That it had to afford privacy and confidentiality, otherwise people would not trust it. The first Privacy Act of Congress authored by Franklin was to create privacy protections for the males. And the story continues, actually. Bell, who did the telephone network, also figured out techniques for encryption, right? Isn't that interesting? Latter part of the 19th century. We established privacy laws as the government was automating computer databases in the 1960s and 70s. We wrote privacy laws for email in the 1980s so that people could make use of it. These are comprehensive, forward-looking frameworks that enable people to take use of new services, allow technologies to grow. The U.S. has been lagging on this effort because there's been too much rhetorical argument and not enough substantive engagement about the very important role that privacy protection plays, safeguarding consumers, and promoting innovation. So, Baron, you can't be against forward-looking frameworks, can you? Well, indeed, I'm, I'm very much for forward-looking frameworks. Uh, my remarks come largely from my Senate testimony before Senator Rockefeller several weeks ago, which some of you may have heard didn't, uh, didn't go particularly well. <laughs> Uh, but I should start, uh, by, so if you want to read more about this, you can read those oral remarks, which are very short, and my uh, testimony, which is, for me, very short, but for most of you would be considered very long. Uh, and I would first of all just stand up and say that, uh, while normally I emphasize that uh, I'm not here on behalf of industry, uh, and I really do represent a broad philosophical framework, Andrew sort of called me out by referring to all those evil data barons. And I will say that I am clearly one of those data barons, and I have to stand up for them on some level. Uh, that was... That was a joke, didn't, it also didn't go very well. Um, so let, let me just start by saying the other side, in, in essence, I think has said two things. Uh, uh, Andrew has said that if government has any value here, it has to be able to legislate, and Mark has said that we need a solution to this problem. And in response, I would say two things. To Andrew, first of all, that, um, that I'm not saying that government uh, has no role here. The question is what that role is, and I think that to think that the role has to be one of legislation is a fundamental mistake. 
law is different from, is broader than legislation and regulation. There are other ways of making law, as I'll explain. And to Mark, I would say that, uh, you heard Mark several times say that we need a solution to this problem. And, and I, this is not a, um, a rhetorical device. This is not scenery when I say this, but I truly believe that there are no solutions. There are only trade-offs. We cannot escape the values that are in competition here, and we cannot pretend that we will find one solution that will forever solve the problem. I think that word is a dangerous word to fall into. Mm -hmm. Let me also say that what I'm arguing for here today is not libertarianism, although that might be the word that I would generally use to describe my own beliefs, but I think the word that Adam and I would both embrace it's not a popular word. It, it sounds a lot like uh, L. Ron Hubbard, and that's an unfortunate accident. But it's a word that Virginia Postrel used in 1998 to talk about uh, her view of the world, and that is dynamism. And I think what, what unites uh, Adam and myself is that belief in evolutionary change over time. And, and the contrast really is between a range of dynamist opinions, some of which might be libertarian, some of which might be more interventionistic. And then on the other side, uh, what Virginia generally described as a stasis mentality, and that is one that comes in two flavors, which I think are well represented here today. Andrew, I think, is a pretty good example of the reactionary mode of the stasis mentality, uh, which seeks to, uh, which fears the future and seeks to try to, 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 to bend the curve to protect us against a scary and unknown uh, future. And, and in similar ways, I think, um, I think it's fair to say that, that Mark is a technocrat. That's not an insult, it's not, not like bureaucrat, but it is to say that, that technocrats in general think that, that we can somehow, one person or, or we can design a, a solution to the problem. And that's not where I'm coming from. What I would rather say is that, as uh, Adam has said, what we need in law are values, uh, just as we need in, in individuals and in society, are values of resiliency and adaptation. And I would point to, uh, Mike Godwin from the Electronic Frontier Foundation who put it best in 1998 when he said that it is always easier to learn from history than it is to learn from the future. Almost always the time-tested laws and legal principles we already have in place are more than adequate to address the new medium. So what, what are those principles? Well, as I said in my Senate testimony, this debate is often framed in terms of whether we need a consumer, a baseline for privacy protection. And the argument for new legislation is essentially we have no baseline. And my response to that is we actually already have a baseline. It is the baseline of consumer protection, and it is one that is embodied by the Federal Trade Commission's doctrines of unfairness and deception. Now, I am not blind to the failings of the Federal Trade Commission. They are a bureaucracy like any other, and I share, on some level, Mark's frustrations. They're never going to be perfect. Even if you have the best people there and you give them all the funding they could ever want, that will never be the fully dynamic evolutionary system that I might prefer to see, which would largely involve the courts and would be more of a true common law approach. But I did in my Senate testimony uh, spend a lot of time thinking about and, and, and explaining why I think the FTC model has failed. And in a nutshell, it is this. The, the entire point of the FTC is not to, to bring lawsuits. It's not that we measure its success by how many times it sues or how many times it, uh, uh, Epic is able to, uh, to get them to bring a consent decree, but rather the extent to which it builds meaningful legal doctrine. That is to say that it takes those concepts of unfairness and deception and gives them meaning. Now, Chairman Rockefeller dismissed that in my testimony as legal, complex legal machinations. Uh, and, and maybe it is complex in some level, but I think that complexity is precisely where resiliency and adaptation lie. So it is to say that uh, those two doctrines protect consumers. They, the, there is a common myth that the FTC can only act if a company says it's going to do something and then fails to do that. I think actually deception itself is far broader than that. There are material omissions. But I would also like to see the FTC explain more uh, how it can use its unfairness doctrine, which in a nutshell says, if a practice harms consumers without a countervailing benefit and consumers themselves cannot reasonably avoid that practice, that that, that can be considered unfair and can be banned. And I explain that to be really concrete, because Mark is right, that this debate is too often about vague principles and not often enough about specific proposals. To be very concrete, I suggest that the FTC explain its analysis and consent decrees. That doesn't happen now, right? These cases do not get litigated, so the courts don't do that. The FTC needs to do it in a consent decree. Second, when they decide not to sue, they should issue no action letters. Why didn't we think there was a problem here? Third, they should issue more advisory opinions to explain to a company that might be trying to push the boundaries of what they're doing, why it's okay to do that. And then finally, and most importantly, they should issue guidelines. Antitrust law is shaped by guidelines that explain how doctrines apply in the real world. If we had those on privacy, we would be in a much better position. And if the FTC had spent time doing that instead of writing its privacy report, which does something very different, I think we would have a much better useful framework today under existing law. 
Uh, thank you, Barry. Now we move to cross-examination. Uh, Andrew and Mark uh, will collectively have a total of 10 minutes to ask questions of Barron and Adam, uh, and the, with the time divvied up between them as they wish. Andrew and Mark can uh, pose questions, and Barron and Adam are obliged to answer succinctly, and if the answers are not succinct, uh, Andrew and Mark can politely reclaim their time. Uh, the congressional hearings, uh, but with substance. Uh, okay, gentlemen. Okay, we're each going to take five minutes, and I'm going to dig right into the details. Uh, the third-party doctrine is about whether or not companies that are in possession of information can turn that information over to the police and others. Would you favor comprehensive baseline legislation that would prevent a company in possession of personal information, customer information, client information, from turning that data over to the police absent a warrant? Well, in indeed, I've spent a lot of my time here putting my money where my mouth is on this to, to answer yes, and that is to say. Yes. Okay, next question. Virtually every Virtually every cell phone that we carry, every laptop that we have, has a little camera on it. And that camera gives others the ability to record what's being viewed through that lens. Would you favor comprehensive legislation that would penalize anybody who gained access to the visual image provided of the lens of a user's cell phone or laptop? Uh, I, it would depend on the circumstances. I think, I think it's very important that the laptops on our camera, for instance, have a blue light that goes on to indicate when the camera is showing. Uh, so are you talking about video that's recorded when the user knows that, or? The user doesn't know. Uh, I think that's a much more defensible proposition. That's the Tyler Clementi you would, case. You would favor that legislation? Well, I, I, think, I think that is something that potentially could be dealt with today. Can uh, the courts deal with that? Uh, so, indeed, we have a model today. So, we have a layered approach today, which okay, is not just the Okay, I think you gave me a yes. I'm just going to keep going because I have well, a limited time. The, the answer is, time. but my, my answer, Mark, is the law actually should, should deal, maybe deal with these problems, but that doesn't necessarily mean legislation. So, should. you would oppose a law that would prohibit the conduct I just described. Well, is that your answer? I, I need to make an important distinction here. M when Mark uses the word law, he's talking about a law, and he's equating that with legislation. Comprehensive and, baseline legislation. That's the statement for our debate. And my answer is law, in general, should deal with these problems. All and right. that may be something that tort can deal with. What I'm about, no. okay. What about employers who, as a condition of employment, require prospective employees to provide their Facebook or Google passwords? Should there be a law that prohibits that activity by employers? In my Senate testimony, I went on record saying that that might be a proper candidate for targeted legislation. I think the only way we'll know about narrow targeted legislation like that is if the FTC actually does what I want them to do to say how far they can go with their existing doctrines. All right, let's, let's go. I mean, my these are actually. No. You're against that also? Yes, I am against that. Wow. I'm against that because why in the hell would you go to work for somebody who demands your password to anything? You have the power to say no. Some people do. Um, okay, so let's, let's get into a tough one, right? I'm presuming that your side believes that we don't need comprehensive legislation because people can make meaningful choices. And as Adam just said, if you don't like the choice presented, you can walk away. So here's my question. Toward the goal of allowing people to make meaningful choice, would you support legislation that mandates notice requirements for companies that collect and use personal information describing how that data would subsequently be used, similar, for example, to food labeling or miles per gallon information about new cars. Would you support such legislation? So again, today we have, uh, we have a, a test for analyzing that sort of thing. The First Amendment allows you to compel companies that, uh, to disclose factual objective um, things about their products. And there's a test for analyzing whether there's an established interest. And I would say that I, and generally speaking, I think that, that that's a better way to deal with these problems, and I think that the answer could be yes. Uh, it depends on whether the, the showing is made that there is a particular problem in a particular circumstance. And you have to, so I, I, you can't say in general this should always be mandated. You have to ask, is there a, a failure in a particular market? We're having this conversation right now over the NTIA's process about the mobile market. I think that might be a good candidate for mandating structured disclosures that can empower consumers. But I wouldn't presume that these things won't come about organically from industry. And I okay. think they would be better designed by industry. I'm going to ask one more question. And My then answer is no. 
Yeah. <laughs> this is easy. Not that for you're, you. not that you're volunteering. Easy. Not that you're this, is, this is easy. But the, <laughs> just but because it's a good social norm doesn't mean it should be the legal norm. Right. Would you have opposed Ben Franklin's effort, Adam, ben to Franklin's provide effort was toward to provide privacy of, protection of for the male? No, it government. says against private persons too. Franklin wanted to protect the males against private persons. Yeah, I think would that, you have opposed the legislation good, that Franklin introduced? I don't know. I, I probably would have supported it at the time. I'm not sure if that wouldn't have been handled in other ways. How about uh, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, which updated the federal wiretap law. Yeah, I think there's a difference that? between how government uses data and how industry uses data. And that government, there's a chasm between that. ECPA limits access by private parties as well. I'm, I'm not saying I know it. I, obviously it does, but Am I, I out I'm, of I'm, time saying there's a I'm having a lot of fun. I could keep okay, going. but You're having too much fun, in okay. fact. And, and if you're giving this up, this, this is okay, your call, fine. but you're five minutes I'll, of the I'll, 10 if you I'll, choose I'll, to use it that way. I'll, or, I'll, I'll turn it over. Okay. Normally I'm on the other side of that, so. <laughs> Um, thank you. Uh, so let me just, I, I mainly have questions for Adam since he's more on my sort of general area. Um, so Adam, you said nothing's new, nothing is new under the sun. So you don't believe that, um, that real-time media, Twitter, Facebook, this massive, what I call in my book, uh, sort of this, this age of great exhibitionism, where, where is the equivalent in historical terms? When has this happened before? We've heard the same sort of arguments and concerns raised about everything. No, from you haven't answered my question. You need to answer specifically my question. When has it happened before? When is there? When, some, when is what happened before, Andy? Something equivalent to this explosion of data. To How about this? the rise of the printing press? The rise of the printing press, obviously. So, okay, fine. So you're saying that maybe it happens once every five or six hundred years, <laughs> but it still means that nothing new under the sun every 500 No, years. how about newspapers? No, you just answered it. You just said the last equivalent you can provide more equivalent was the invention of the witness. Well, but the equivalent of the, the printing press, which was five or 600 years ago. And I think you're right. I think that this is a major historical change. So maybe there is nothing new ever under the sun, but it's once every well, 500 you. years. Once every 500 years. So remind that for governments. You need the government once every 500 years. Um, Information wants to be free. I hate that term, but maybe it's right. I don't know what it means. But if it's true, Adam, how do consumers feel about that when their information wants to be free, wants to be distributed? Oh, I'm sure consumers like me are worried about that, very concerned about that, and legitimately so. Also concerned about the fact that many other forms of information want to be free, including things that should be secure, things that are filthy, pornographic. You know, I mean, I'm not comfortable with a lot of the things that are free but, but, out there because information makes it easier. But then, but, but, but we're not, but we're not, but you're not, we're not arguing about, say, pedophilia, pedophilia images. No one's no. suggesting that those should be legal either. I mean, um, so if, those, if the vast majority of citizens are very uncomfortable with information wanting to be free, their information, their personal intimate data, uh, isn't it the responsibility of government to actually act on, on the wishes of their consumers? Because all the data so far shows, all the research shows, that consumers are deeply concerned and want governments to act. No, that shouldn't be the first order of business. The first order of business should be individual responsibility. It should be taking responsibility for what is yours and what you think should be done with it. You can only go to the government when you can find a bona fide harm that is legitimate and is actionable, and then we bring in government. Because when you bring in government, it changes the way information operates, and it potentially stifles it and stifles other forms of uh, creativity. You have this argument, how far do we want to go? You say that, um, that we never know. But the nature of technology is such, it moves so fast. It's like this, this, this onrushing stream, this avalanche. That argument means that we can never make any legislation about this stuff, because we never know what's going to happen next year. No, that's we a straw man. But, Pardon? That's a straw man. I mean, the reality but is... A, but you said it. How far do we want to go? Yeah, and I'll tell you how far I want to go. Uh, what I want is I want laws that do allow for actual harm against individuals to be actionable. Now, we can debate what actual harm is, but there are standards both in the realm of philosophy and in the realm of, you know, traditional positive law that deal with what harm is and what constitutes it. Now, we will have a debate over that, and I am certain that when it comes to a lot of privacy issues, we will not be able to come to common ground on what harm is. But I do think baseline consumer protection laws, Section 5 of the FTC, unfair and deceptive practices, stuff like this makes a lot of sense. There are legitimate harms that need to be addressed, and those kind of broad-based laws can do it. 
So you also, you bring up the, the classic defense, which I think is a bad defense, which is the SOPA defense, this idea that all legislation by definition will break the internet. Are you suggesting then, you, you said that crushing all the things we love about the internet, you, you speak for yourself, we love about the internet, um, this is an argument that gets trotted out any time there's ever an attempt to legislate the internet, from protecting, uh, protecting um, copyright, to protecting kids, to protecting individual data. Would you acknowledge that, and, and obviously this is a rhetorical question, uh, would you acknowledge that that's a ridiculously bogus argument, that, that any time anyone ever wants to, to change anything about the internet, the, the, the defenders of the status quo, which you guys are, scream, you're going to break the thing, you're going to destroy it? There are degrees of harm that legislation can do depending on the nature of that legislation. Certainly there are some bills like SOPA and in the old days like mandatory filtering or censorship bills that would have absolutely gone to the very core of what the internet was all about and destroyed much of what was good about it. Now let me just quickly ask the, the data, Baron, final question. Uh, Baron, both of you perhaps, do you trust companies like Google and Facebook whose very business model, whose dependence on the free economy is premised essentially on peddling our personal data and selling it to advertisers? We're not defenders of the status quo as much as you might like to paint us that way. And the trust that I put is not in any particular company because companies are profit-maximizing enterprises. The trust that we put is in the evolutionary process by which markets, technological change, and criticism from civil society, including groups like Epic, disciplines corporate behavior. I think that overall, as a, as a layered approach, it's messy, but I think it tends to work better than government. And I have outlined that I think government has a role to play when that fails. Out of time uh, for that side, and so now, uh, Baron and Adam, you have uh, 10 minutes uh, for your cross-examination. I expect you to uh, exercise uh, or extend the same courtesy that you were extended. Or lack of courtesy. <laughs> In Andrew's case. Uh, Andrew, to quote uh, my favorite line from The Princess Bride, uh, or to paraphrase it, in your book you use the word libertarianism a lot. I do not think that word means what you think it means. What do you think it means? Um, Briefly. What I think libertarianism means, intrinsic hostility to government. Okay. Would you characterize my positions today, having outlined a role for the FTC as, quote, intrinsic hostility to government? I think, Baron, you are a neo-libertarian. I'm not sure what that means, but let's move on. Uh, Mark. You mentioned that you want to see uh, the conversation revolve around specific proposals, and I agree with that. And you also said we need criteria for assessing what are good privacy proposals. Briefly put, what are your criteria? Um, I think legislation should be forward-looking. Uh, I think it should be technology neutral. I think it should be uh, simple. Uh, I think it should be baseline in the sense that, you know, we may get new approaches in the states, and I'm actually a big privacy federalist. I think that States should be able to innovate on the legislative front. I don't want a one-size-fits-all Washington uh, solution. Um, those are the kinds of criteria. And surprisingly, Baron, if you sit down with some of the you know, business folks who are also concerned about privacy, and even if they do the right thing, they oftentimes find themselves being punished by companies they compete against who don't, they favor similar proposals. They would like to see some clarity and some baseline protections with the understanding that everybody plays by the same rules. I think there's actually more agreement here than you might, uh, well, as might I said, know. Mark, I think there's a range of opinions across the spectrum of dynamism. You've already heard some differences today between me and, and, uh, and Adam. We clearly come at this somewhat differently. This is not just about libertarianism. And I, I hear you trying to appeal to dynamism. But at the end of the day, what, you, what you're I think generally advocating for, at least at, 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 on some level, is a prescriptive, preemptive regulatory system that is based, as Adam said, on the precautionary principle. Is that not true? One out of four of those characteristics are correct. Which All one? law is prescriptive, so that didn't say anything. I purposefully said it's not preemptive. It's not precautionary in the sense that we know that the problem's out there already. I mean, we know about identity theft, security breach, consumer complaints. This problem is off the charts so Mark, in the United States. Mark, so not, and your, so third, your third term was also incorrect, so you'd have to remind me what it was. But, you know, let's, 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 be, uh, let's be precise here, right? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, okay. you, you may not be understanding the, the, what I'm saying. That, and, that this may be a mutual problem. 
Do you, do, you, do, you, do you think at the end of the day that we Oh, regulatory. That was your third word. You said my approach was regulatory. And actually, I've testified in Congress, I'm not a big fan of federal regulation. I actually prefer simple statutes, you know, like the video privacy law. It was a page and a half. People understood it. The OECD privacy guidelines, another page and a half. You look at the HIPAA regulations, they go on for 1,500 pages. I would oppose it just because of the reading requirement. I mean, that's not the way to do privacy law. Let me ask a question going back to uh, innovation, which is something you mentioned at the beginning, Mark, and you were essentially making the case, I believe indirectly at least, that if we had more privacy legislation or law in general, we would have more innovation in the tech economy. This is something we hear a lot, um, a point made by the Obama administration in its white papers and by many other privacy advocates. But would you acknowledge, Mark, that there is a, an inherent trade-off associated with uh, layering on more law and regulation in this area, and specifically that, you know, the point that Barron and I tried to make in a lot of our work, that, the, you know, there really is no free lunch, that something has to power the digital economy. And we have been getting a lot of innovation so far, and that innovation has been driven by the fact that information is the lifeblood of our new economy, and that data collection is an important part of that and it provides a lot of wonderful services and goods for consumers at a very reasonable price, sometimes the most reasonable price of zero. Do you acknowledge that there is a trade-off here and that potentially privacy law regulation could increase prices to consumers or lack or well, diminished uh, services? I would have picked up on this earlier anyway because Barron made a similar point. I'm actually very much against the notion of trade-off. I think it's a big mistake in Washington when we have policy debates to say that you confront a trade-off or to say that we strike a balance, because it creates a presumption that one of the interests on the table cannot be fully addressed because by definition, as you both have described the uh, problem, we simply can't have two desirable outcomes. And I think this is crazy. I really do. Think about it for a moment. You know, we can have lots of food in the United States, but we have to accept that there'll be a trade-off that it won't be safe. You know, we can have cars in the United States. We have to accept that they'll be very dangerous because we can't do anything about auto safety. We have to accept that we'll have industrial production, but we can't protect, you know, workers. I mean, this is all 19th century guys, and we're way, so way beyond that. Time because we're getting into fantasy world. Right? Okay, you're halfway done. No uh, Adam, Adam, you're, you're I, halfway I, done. You have five this, minutes left. This is why we legislate. We legislate so that people can take advantage of new services without having to give up things they shouldn't be required to give up. It's actually right, fairly so straightforward. Cake and eat it too. We can have cars that never kill anybody, and there will never be any deaths on the highway. Right? The fact is, Mark, there are trade-offs all the time, and the question is where you draw those lines. We try to reduce the risks. I mean, really, we try to balance don't we agree on risks. that? We try to balance risks. And my question was, uh, in that balancing, do you accept the fact that your proposals could result in consumers having access to fewer services, high, less quality services, or being forced so to pay higher back, prices? If there's a question there, let's go back to yeah, Benjamin Franklin. A okay, so I don't Price think... asked and not answered. Well, look, Benjamin Franklin well, answered it. Franklin didn't say, say, oh, my goodness. Yes or no, or no I don't accept that there are trade-offs, and neither did Franklin. Franklin said it was actually necessary to have privacy protection for the new service to work. He didn't say, oh, my goodness, if we protect the privacy of the males, it'll become less useful to people. It was the opposite. I mean, it's, it's not... Um, an obvious or intuitive point, but it's really worth emphasizing here because this is a frequent trap in the privacy okay. debate. Well, let's get very specific. Can Daniel, I add something just to no, add you no, can't. I'm sorry, we're <laughs> running out of time. Uh, Daniel Barth Jones is a medical privacy health researcher. He recently came out with a study explaining that uh, the, the basis that Latanya Sweeney, uh, her 1997 study about uh, the risk of reidentification, which was the basis for the HIPAA rule. That, that rulemaking, which basically said that, there, that, that re-identification is inevitable, which caused the, uh, the HIPAA rules to be drawn in a way that severely curtailed the sharing of data, that he estimates that that, that has killed somewhere between 30 and 50,000 people because of the restrictions on the availability of medical data, in particular with for one drug alone, which was Vioxx, right? So now, now, in other words, what was, what was limited there is the, avail avail excuse me, the availability of data to medical researchers and the conditions under which uh, data could be shared because researchers had to get consent from individual subjects. Now, Mark, this is, this is a real-world trade-off. People have actually died because Vioxx was on the market for years longer than it would have been had these restrictions not been in place, had data flowed more freely to provide the basis for a sounder evaluation. What do you say to that? Well, 
uh, look, I'm not familiar with the paper, so I don't know if the summary is accurate, but as to Sweeney, A, she's not responsible for the passage of HIPAA, and B, she didn't say that re-identification or de-identification doesn't work. Her paper actually stands for the opposite proposition, which is that de-identification can be made to work if it's done correctly, and if it's done poorly, then you will be able to re-identify the sample. Now, here's the interesting point about innovation, since this is the question you're asking me. I do believe that with legislative uh, incentives, we will develop better privacy technologies so that we can do this kind of medical research without jeopardizing the records of individual identifiable patients. But the incentives will only be there if the legislation is enacted, which was actually the point of Sweeney's study, that if you don't have protections, so in other words, you're going to end you up with we poor can, We can get to a world where we never have to deal with these I haven't said never or perfect at any time. Those are your words. Question. He hasn't the question. Yeah. Let me ask Andrew a question. He hasn't had a chance to... Uh, be engaged yet. Um, Andrew, uh, in your book and in some of your subsequent writings and speeches, you've uh, talked about how you favor some sort of right to be forgotten or so-called right to oblivion, which is a very popular notion right now in the EU. Um, assuming that you believe trade-offs are real, unlike uh, Mark, um, do you believe that there are some rather profound trade-offs there in terms of the freedom of speech uh, considerations? or what it means for journalists and historians uh, enabled to be able to, yeah, we've got about 90 seconds. It's a good question. Um, I, I think the, the, the question is framed in the wrong way. Um, the legislation is coming out of the EU is the right to be forgotten from Vivian Redding. I, I would acknowledge implicit, perhaps the implicit part of the question of how realistic this legislation, how practical it is. You, you're right, there. It, it, I'm not entirely sure it can be done. But I think your question reflects a misunderstanding of the new world. Uh, people on Facebook, people on Twitter, people in, in our new data ecosystem, they're not lawyers, they're not historians, they're, all, they're not all Winston Churchill or FDR or Obama. Sorry, George, 30, 30 seconds. seconds. So, so uh, finally, Mark, uh, Epic in 2004 sued to block Gmail's invasion of privacy, saying that users shouldn't be able to make that choice, that trade-off between having a, a free email service that provide them an unprecedented quality of service and having some monitoring of their, of their uh, email to deliver them ads. Would you have done the same thing today? Well, yes Baron, or no? I'll answer. I have to say I just lost a bet, actually, because the Epic staff is over here, and we had an over-under Oh, I know. And the answer for, is for, yes or no. For how long I've asked this question many times example. before. Yes or, no? yes or no? What was the question? Ah. Would, would you have sued to block Gmail today and take it off the market? Would you, have, if you had to do, do, do it over again, would you have done the same thing? You did sue uh, in 2004. Would you do that again? Would I sue? I would today. Um, yes, under a, an, under a different theory, probably. I would bring a complaint to the FTC that non-Gmail subscribers did not consent to have the contents of their email being scanned by Google. Yes, I think it's okay. still a good claim. Well, again, okay, well, no trade-offs for anyone in the audience. <laughs> that doesn't mean I mean, that it couldn't folks, be done folks, better. This is, this is closing statement time, and both of you will have time to, to bring this point up, the, um, whether, whether Gmail should be legal or not to offer. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, Andrew and Mark, you have six minutes to divvy up as you see fit uh, to, uh, in terms of closing uh, statements, uh, and uh, then we'll give Baron and Adam uh, six minutes as well. Okay, I'll go first. So you give me a 30-second warning yes. at three minutes. Uh, it's been a really interesting debate. Um, I, I think Adam, uh, this is where I wanted to jump in. Uh, Adam or Barron was talking about that the basic argument, my sense from what they're saying, is that consumers lose out if we have legislation because the technology gets less innovative, we destroy innovation. And at one point, I think Adam or, or Beren talked about this idea of increasing price. But of course, the reality of our digital economy, whether it's Gmail or Facebook, is there is no price. And I think what needs to be legislated in many respects is what we now call the free economy. What needs to be legislated is the idea that consumers think they're getting the best deal of all, which is free. But it never really is free. Because the more we embrace this free economy, the more we embrace free services like Google, Gmail, or Facebook, the more indeed we're taken advantage of. So the kind of 
legislation I would like to see is not, I, I, you know, I'm, I certainly don't want Google Gmail, Gmail or Facebook banned. I'm not suggesting that they should be uh, made illegal. But what I think we need in this free economy where consumers are taken advantage of, where there's increasing consumer ignorance about the real nature of this economy, is much tighter laws on how these companies actually reveal their products and services to consumers. So for example, one piece of legislation I think that would be very helpful is maybe not this formal right to be forgotten, but forcing technology companies to put together terms of service which are comprehensible to ordinary people that doesn't require people to actually hire lawyers or spend entire days or weeks trying to understand them. I think what this, uh, companies like Google and Facebook have fetishized the idea of radical transparency. But the reality of the free economy is it's incredibly opaque. It's incredibly hard to figure out what these companies are up to and how they're using or abusing our data. So the kind of legislation I would like to see is not banning, is not doing away with innovation, is not forcing remarkable companies like Google and, and Facebook out of business, but is simply tightening things up so that these really smart people in Silicon Valley are not able to take advantage of consumers in ways they have and essentially mystify people and play cat and mouse with consumers in ways that give people vertigo, which is why I call my book Digital Vertigo. Okay, so um, this is a you know a great debate, and again, I think it's really wonderful that we can have a nice public debate here at the press club. It doesn't happen enough, actually, on privacy issues. I think part of what's interesting about this debate is there's kind of a shadow debate in the background, and I'm going to just draw attention to this to explain why I think uh, we do need comprehensive privacy legislation. Um, Adam and Barron, I think, are, you know, for reasons probably well-based, just skeptical of government regulation. It almost wouldn't matter what topic we were debating. Do we need comprehensive environmental legislation? Do we need comprehensive safety legislation? I think their position would simply be no, because they don't like government legislation, which is, you know, it's fine. I mean, that's, that's their view of the world. But, but we're debating a more narrow issue here today. And EPIC, by the way, is not pre-inclined toward legislation. And in that sense, this is a little asymmetric. I didn't come here to argue, you know, that we need lots and lots more government. The very interesting thing about EPIC is actually our founding was over the freedom to use encryption when the government was trying to regulate that practice. We said that's wrong. We said the government should not be regulating a privacy technique. People should have the freedom to use it. And as to freedom, by the way, my view is that people should have the freedom to disclose as much or as little information online as they choose to do. But it should be their choice. It should not be the choice of the company that has provided them a service, which has subsequently concluded, oh, look at the way we could extract all this value if people provide us this information for one purpose and we can use it for lots and lots of other purposes. That's simply unfair. And that's why I think we do need comprehensive privacy legislation because information is being collected about individuals and used in ways that they did not agree to, that they did not have control over, and they cannot individually effectively obtain redress. If there were alternatives to legislation, if there were technological ways to provide that degree of privacy, which by the way we've pushed for over the years, we believe in you know, techniques of anonymization, anonymization and, and de-identification, all of that. It's great stuff. The reality is it's not working. It's not protecting users online. Their data remains at risk, and in too few circumstances are companies actually bearing that cost. And this is where government does step in. This is where government says we have a problem, now let's work together to find a solution. Not every solution that people propose to the problem is going to be a good one, but this is what policy debates are about. Now we begin to pick and choose which approaches make sense, which things will be you know, viable a few years from now, which things completely outdated. Privacy Act passed 1974 said government agencies collecting data on citizens had privacy obligations set out in a lot of detail, but the principle is a very, very good one. Forty years later, it's still working. We need a similar approach to online privacy today. Over the long term, it is what will sustain and enable the growth of this technology. Okay, and for rebuttal, another six minutes to beat up as you see fit. Thank you, Declan. Uh, I'll be brief. I'll give uh, Baron the balance of the time. 
In all my work on online child safety and on uh, digital privacy, I try to stress one simple principle, which is that not every complex social problem or phenomena lends itself well to some sort of a silver bullet solution or a convoluted regulatory regime. It's just the reality of the information age that legislation doesn't work as well as some of us probably wish it would, because uh, some of these concerns are legitimate that have been raised. But I find that the more fruitful way of going forward in addressing these concerns, whether they be online child safety or digital privacy, is to rely on social and evolutionary market norms to try to find a way to do this in an organic, bottom-up, evolutionary, and dynamic fashion, to rely on, yes, some of the existing legal principles are out there, but to understand that they have their limits, and that more often than not, taking a more educational and empowerment-based approach to addressing these things will better equip us and our children for the future. But at the end of the day, I really do think that this particular debate today comes down to the fact that Mark, in particular, denies the fact that there are trade-offs associated with regulation. And I stand guilty of charge, as charged of Mark's accusation that I am skeptical of government intervention in the Internet economy. You better believe I am. I do not think it will often work as well as others hope. And I think that there are costs to trying, both costs to the tech economy, costs to Internet innovators, but also costs to Internet consumers and to all of us collectively as a society both as taxpayers and as individuals who enjoy the benefits of the information economy. Remember, we have lived our entire human civilization in a state of vast information poverty. We now have information abundance, and we're screaming bloody murder about how awful it is. I mean, isn't that an irony that we, uh, we, we need to get you know, in, in touch with? Because I think reality is there are more benefits to what's happening today than drawbacks and costs, especially when you consider uh, the sorts of proposals that are being set forth, which I think ultimately won't uh, solve the problems that Mark and Andrew fear. Uh, again, I want to reiterate that uh, we are not defenders of the status quo. We are presenting an alternative vision of how to deal with problems as they arise, and one that is fundamentally grounded, not, not first and foremost in a skepticism about government, but in a skepticism of people who present solutions. And in saying that, that the trade-offs here are inevitable, not just between privacy and other values, but between competing forms of privacy. Look, th this is just not something that can be reduced to simple solutions. And in that sense, I want to re re uh, reiterate the distinction I made between a law and law. And let me give you two examples to make this really clear. So Mark talked about the example of ECPA. Well, I've been involved, I've spent a lot of my time working on the Digital Due Process Coalition to update ECPA to make sure that it reflects Fourth Amendment values to protect our privacy against government in the future. Um, the problem is ECPA is, is, is a... Is a is a good example of legislation that is prescriptive, that attempts to imagine what the future is going to be like. And that's precisely why we in the Digital Due Process Coalition are in the position we're in of trying to update it, because they couldn't imagine what the future was going to look like. They, ima they never imagined that anyone would keep their, their email on a remote server for more than 180 days. So I, I think that ECPA is actually a wonderful example of where, law, uh, where, where legislation fails. But if you want an example of where law actually serves us well, give you two examples. One is the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment is a law. It is a, it is a legal principle that um, could be, uh, if it were allowed by the courts to develop in this area, that is to say absent what Mark mentioned, which is the third party doctrine, which is the only reason we have ECPA at all, the only reason we're not applying the Fourth Amendment directly, that would have protected our privacy better against government. Similarly, the private sector, we have a law. We have baseline legislation in the area of consumer protection, which is about unfairness and deception. The problem is that w when you have a law like that, a foundational law, what you need to build is law on top of that, that develops over time those principles. And my central argument today is that the FTC doesn't do that. And if you want to take away one thing to remember from this debate, it is that what is astonishing more than anything else about this conversation uh, in Washington about privacy is that we all presume in these conversations that the FTC doesn't work, it's failed as a model, and yet no one ever asks these basic questions about process. What does the FTC do all day? Sure, they're out there, they mean well, they try to protect consumers, but be because they don't explain themselves, they do not build law in the, in the uppercase sense that I am talking about it. And that, in general, is something that I think is a better alternative. It is an evolutionary, resilient model that is better able to deal with these problems in the future. In, in particular, the one thing that, that, that matters more in that debate than anything else, which Mark uh, sidestepped, is the question of harm. Mark used the term unfairness. He said it's unfair for companies to do something. These conversations revolve around the fair information practice principles. 
Well, I think unfairness is actually a useful term, but it's a term that has to be given concrete meaning. And fortunately, we have a legal doctrine at that at the FTC. Again, is there a harm? Is it outweighed by a countervailing benefit? Can consumers reasonably avoid that harm? That's the right question. Unfortunately, the FTC doesn't help us build the, the, the toolkit for analyzing that question in the future. And the question that I more than anything else wanted to ask of Mark before we ran out of time was how to define harm. Because going forward, that's where this fight's going to be. I, I think we're probably not going to see legislation anytime soon of the comprehensive sort that some people want. What I want to see is this sort of process reform at the FTC, get the FTC to think more clearly about these things and define harm. And as I've said, they can do that as they litigate, but more than anything else, we need to have guidelines. We need to have these things explained. It's not gonna be perfect. It's not the model that I would have wanted, which is you develop these things through the courts, but it's a better model. And at, at the end of the day, what Adam and I are saying here is, don't make the best of the enemy of the good. Don't imagine that you can find some permanent solution because you will find, just like ECPA, that it will not keep pace with technological change. Baron, and so let, let me, um, before we go to audience uh, questions, uh, let me ask the audience for a favor. The proposition to be uh, debated was uh, consumer privacy can be adequately protected without new legislation. On the affirmative, Baron and Adam, on the negative, Mark and Andrew. Now, um, uh, can, uh, I'd like to poll the audience uh, to see uh, what they, uh, who they think, this is an informal way of scoring, who made the, the mo more compelling overall argument. So, uh, f um, uh, for, uh, let, let's, let's hear it for the negative first. Uh, they went first. Uh, let's here for them first. Uh, if you uh, agree that Mark and Andrew made the more compelling overall argument, uh, let's see a show of hands, please. So, uh, one, two, three, four. Keep them up. Uh, so, okay, the, the, the epic table is clearly in favor of, uh, of, <laughs> of Mark's position. Um, and now let's hear it for uh, Baron and Adam on the, on the affirmative. Can, uh, no new legislation needed. Show of hands, please. What, what, what do you think, folks? That's the wisdom of the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there might be a, a narrow victory for, for Baron and, uh, Baron and Adam. Uh, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to say, especially if we discount the ones who are conflicted out. None of the above. Okay, uh, it, uh, the ones who, ones who are... Uh, ha, uh, <laughs> both are they can't both be correct. Um, okay, let, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's hear it for these folks. A round of applause. <laughs> Okay, now you have, you have questions that are probably more intelligent than the ones I would be able to ask. So uh, if, if there's a microphone, uh, I, there must be one circulating around somewhere. Um, uh, is, is there one? Okay, uh, let's get started in the back. Uh, if, if, it's if you could, okay. if you could, do, could you identify yourself if, if Hi. you don't mind? Hi, I'm Denise Taylor. I'm the CEO of Privo, which is Privacy Vaults Online. We're one of the FTC safe harbors under COPPA. I have two questions. The first one's just a yes or no answer, and the other one is just curious what the panel might think. So the first is, does anybody on the panel believe that without the COPPA regulation, whether it works well or not, uh, that industry would have done the right thing and minimized the collection of data use and disclosure of children's personal information? Some of them wouldn't have, no doubt about it. Um, I think there's clearly some bad apples out there. The question is, were there other ways that we could have dealt with them? That's, I think, a fair question. Um, I don't know, you want to yes. say more on that? Yeah. I know you want yes or no, but it's a depends answer. I, well, I, I don't know, it either exists, we either passed it or we didn't, it either made it. Okay, th so the other question is, um, does anyone have a comment about what the national strategy for trusted identity in cyberspace that's coming out of NIST um, how that may play into helping consumers protect their privacy, but still giving business a chance to uh, interact with customers the way that they want to. Well, actually, Amy uh, Stepanovich here on the Epic staff is doing a lot of work um, with that group. And I understand the aim is to create a platform where there are multiple authentication providers. You have no sort of single unitary uh, company that vouches for ID, which is probably a good thing. Um, there are serious privacy issues, of course, in the collection simply of identity. 
Senator Franken has a hearing this afternoon looking at facial recognition techniques, which is nothing more than the collection of your identity from someone who's most likely a stranger. So we think there's a real issue, particularly when the government gets in the identity business. We're not, again, saying it shouldn't happen, but I think there have to be uh, some meaningful safeguards. One of my um, long-term concerns in this area, and I've been you know, trying to warn the, the Senate uh, and, and the House for a long time, I think as we move into the area of biometric identifiers, um, the risks of identity theft and the consequences are actually going to be much, much more severe than what we're familiar with today. You lose your credit card number and your checking account, those things get reissued. You lose control of the digital representation of your fingerprints or your face. The reissuance is kind of a hard problem, as my, as my friends say. So that's one of the things that I think um, the, the committee is going to look at. And since Mark's given a shout out to his team on this, I would only say that Jim Harper's done good work in this area. Uh, you might want to talk to him. But, yes, but, right. but, but I, would, I would also just say in particular that, that I, my, my primary concern here is about government monopolizing the provision of identity. I think that that's something, and, and you know, there are things we agree on. And, and you yeah. know, in general, when, when government is the enemy, we, we tend to agree. Uh, and, and I think it's, I, I think it's important that, we, um, we, that, that it truly is a platform for competing identity uh, provision services. Thank you. Right. And Denise, let, let me add one thing, and this is not an area I'm an expert in at all, so I would defer to others here, but I do understand that this is uh, in many ways going to be a creature of state law insofar as states will determine uh, what identity credentials are acceptable for state, uh, for state legal purposes. And in that regard, I would just call everyone's attention to Virginia, which as I understand it, uh, has commissioned their high-tech task force to issue a model uh, a legislation for Virginia, and the uh, default assumption there seems to be that this has to be done, the provision of identity has to be done by government. So, uh, Right, and all I'm saying is that the intention here in Washington may end up being uh, 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 foiled by folks at the state level who think otherwise. But again, I would defer to people who know more about this. Some other, other folks and some other topics. So we can come back if there's, if there's time. Chris Bowen with Verizon. Uh, and I realize to a certain extent we're debating extremes here, but uh, I had heard uh, Adam said to Andrew, you know, what's, what's the extent to which you would see law go? Where would be the end point? Uh, but I also heard Adam say uh, that we should be thinking about this in terms of humanity adapting, trying to develop coping me mechanisms. And the first thing I thought of when I heard that was well, if we had come out of World War II or even looked at the misuse of personal information in the context of the Cold War, that way we might live in a very different society today. And I'm wondering, you know, what is the extent to which you would rely on coping mechanisms or development of hum human adaptation in the context of misuse of personal information? scope of the harm that, that is under consideration. And if you're talking about government collection and use of personal information for purposes of rounding people up and putting them in camps, I think there's a pretty clear harm there. If you're talking about collecting personal information for serving up somebody an ad for a better canoe that they might like online, I don't think there's a harm. But then does that rely upon having the person with the best, best tort lawyer wins? I'm sorry, I don't understand. person having the best tort lawyer wins? Not if you're talking about what the, the, the law should be in terms of, you know, let, let, let I'm me, not sure I understand. Let me jump in here. I think, I think what you're asking is how, how do you make law? And what you're suggesting is that somehow this is, this is an unfair process because it's just up to who has the better lawyer. Well, ultimately, you know, this gets back to Andrew's question. Who, who do I trust? Andrew seems to think that I trust companies. What I actually trust here, if I trust anything, and in general, we don't trust much. That's our, that's our basic message is I trust in an overall process that over time will produce not a perfect result, but a result that will be better than one that will come out of the, the situation that, that Mark described, which is what he, what he envisions is the ultimate technocratic model, which is you bring together a bunch of experts, you have a bunch of solutions presented, and then to use his words, you pick and choose among them. And I think that that model is one that, that really does not generally work well. And I prefer a model. Democratic government. Yeah. Right by, I mean, by technocrats. No, I've, I'm not saying by technocrats. I'm saying this is how modern democracies confront problems and try to reach solutions. You're saying that you don't like that approach. You just want to leave people out there to fend no, for Mark, themselves. No, Mark, what I'm and saying. Can is I just continue the point? Because it was actually interesting. It came across in both 
you know, the points you and I have made. You guys use, you know, like resilience and trade-off. I feel like we're going to war here. I mean, privacy protection shouldn't be that daunting. We should come up with solutions that work for people. I mean, part of what you're describing here is almost kind of like a privacy survivalist ethic, you know? Why, why should people so more, have more to, why should people I, have I to be believe, resilient? I mean, we could spend a day talking about resiliency, which is a well-established... Well, we using that word, res resiliency. There's a, new, that? there's a new book out by Andrew Zolli, who runs PopTech called, I think it's either Resiliency or Resilience. I'm doing actually a review for it. And it's an interesting, I, I, I'm just not sure, where do you get this word from? Are you using it in a formal sense, or is it just the word you've chosen? This is a well-established term that comes out of many different disciplines. You can look in the field of environmental policy, you can look in the field of behavioral economics, you can look in the field of law, you can look in the field of social sciences. There is loads of literature on resiliency theory. This isn't something new or radical, and what it comes down to is creating coping mechanisms and finding ways to learn how to adapt to new technological or social realities. Can I add one other thing? Is this, the other piece of your argument seems to be that if you do legislate here in any way, you're going to kill innovation. But I'm, from, I'm one of the few people in this room from Silicon Valley. I have a, a show on TechCrunch where I interview entrepreneurs every week. And, and what you would see if, if you did have some legislation, you're already actually seeing it in some ways, is you would see the emergence of new forms of innovation. Innovation, say, for example, centered on privacy, on new uh, services, apps, products, platforms. So this idea that there only can be one kind of legislation, uh, one kind of innovation, and any time you interfere in the digital economy, you're killing innovation, is simply wrong. Andrew's clearly attacking a straw man. You, um, Jim Harper here has denounced me with the hashtag, not a libertarian, for having said yes in, in, in response to several of Mark's questions and for having uh, defended uh, several very old pieces of legislation. So I'm obviously not saying that any piece of legislation is going to break the internet as we know it. But Baron, I'm going to cut you off because we're, we run the risk Adam, of restarting the debate. Hold on, I'm going to cut you off as well. It's, uh, we, we, uh, Baron, Baron is an FTC enthusiast. Let's leave it at that. Uh, let's move on to some other questions uh, from the audience. Uh, please, would somebody please tell Chairman Rockefeller that? more than other... Brad, Brad Jansen, Center for Financial Privacy and Human Rights. This is to Mark. Mark, you repeatedly brought up the example of Ben Franklin and the Postal Service as, you know, a way of getting consumer trust. But of course, we do know that the Postal Service has very often been used by government for surveillance against the customer. So it's sort of a, soft, a false promise that was given that you're using to defend. You also use the term Pony Express erroneously, because the Pony Express was actually an extra legal private market solution to government failure. Now, Barron has accused you of basically wanting sort of a privacy pro, um, pro, uh, Prohibitionist? Yeah, well, <laughs> privacy Soviet some, or, or, or something to, 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 to govern everything, Politeuro. but you've actually argued for, you know, laboratories of democracy and referring to, you know, state solutions that would become more widely adopted. Aren't you basically just a closet libertarian that hasn't come to terms with it yet? <laughs> <laughs> It's not the first time someone's asked that question. Um, well, you know, I mean, we actually do agree on a lot, right? I mean, the, the truth is, you know, I suspect maybe 70% of the privacy issues, you, you know, we probably agree on. Um, where we disagree, and I think we need to be precise, is, you know, for example, whether the president's proposed Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights should be enacted into law. Let's make the question that crisp. I would say yes. I think the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights is a very good framework. It's very familiar to business. They already do it in much of the world. Why not in, establish it in the United States? I think Adam and, and Barry would say, no, this is, you know, government regulation. We oppose it. Let's let this evolving process at the FTC. And I have to say, Baron, you really are quite a big fan of the FTC issuing more reports. I mean, people are going to wonder about that a little bit. I think they issue enough reports and uh, we're not looking for more. But, but, I mean, to your point, look, we would support that. We would support legislating it. I don't think they would. Yeah, so to just to be really clear, what I, don't, what I don't want is more reports. The reports that the FTC has issued are frankly not particularly helpful. What I want is for the FTC to do in the area of privacy the kinds of things that it does say in antitrust law, which is it says, here are the doctrines we've had, here's how we've explained them in the past, here's what the law is going to mean uh, moving forward, and answering the hard questions like, what is harm? Right? This is the sort of analysis that the courts actually force in the area of antitrust and that does not happen in the area of privacy. Can I ask a friendly question? Uh, 
question. I mean, it's a great question, and we didn't really get into it. But one of the big FTC actions concerned Google when Google transformed Gmail into Buzz, and people found their private email addresses publicly available because they had basically been opted into Google Social Network Service. And the FTC opened an investigation. Would you have considered that a harm, or would you have said that's just you know, Google trying to build a, a competing social network product as against Facebook. Yeah, so first of all, I think this is precisely the right question to ask. So is, is, is to not talk about harm on an abstract level, but to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis and under the, the facts and circumstances at issue. And, and, and there are cases where I think the, the uh, and I'm, I'm not trying to dodge your question at all, I'm trying to say that the answers are difficult. But if you look at, for example, Howard Beals, who's been, a, is, you know, someone who generally agrees with me, Howard has actually argued the FTC has understated what they can do with harm, and Howard has pointed to enforcement actions that, he's, that he himself brought when he ran the Bureau of Enforcement. For example, uh, in the case of, of spoofing and sending out uh, pornographic emails that seem to be from your email address, right? That, there's a clear reputational harm there because people think that you're sending out something that you're not, right? That's an example of harm that I, I'm okay with. My answer to your question is, I, I think, you develop these things on a case-by-case -case basis. And the question you have to ask in Buzz is precisely, is it a harm to expose the people that I have privately been corresponding with? And I think there's a good argument that it is. But that's not the end of the analysis. The, the other questions are about benefit and about whether consumers themselves could have avoided that. And, I think, and, and that's why I think unfairness is such a great and useful tool. If you, if you take each of those three things and you apply them in a particular case and you explain what your analysis is, we could avoid situations like that in the future and allow companies to draw a, a, a good balance. Because at the end of the day, the arguments that you and others make, or maybe, maybe not you so much today, but, but certainly others make for comprehensive legislation, is that it provides clarity. But there are two well, ways let's, to provide... Let's, let's so, stop right on. there. Just, well, we, we, you'll, get, you'll get some more time. Hold. Law provides clarity in that fashion, too. Uh, let's move on to the next question at the risk of restarting this debate a second time or third time. Uh, please. Hi, um, this is Ginger from the Electronic Privacy Information Center. Um, so Baron, you had been somewhat critical of ECPA, and certainly that's understandable at this point. There are some provisions that need to be changed there. It's not the best act, but it is at least good legislation. And you had suggested alternatively that we should rely on the Fourth Amendment and the court application of that. But to me, that seems very problematic, considering that it's taken about 25 years for courts to start recognizing a privacy interest in email. And only recently in the Warshak case did that really start. And it still isn't true across the board. So if you talk about ambiguity, there's great ambiguity there, because different courts have come to different rulings. So how do you handle the fact that a lot of courts have been very reluctant to really take on technology and apply the Fourth Amendment to it? Ginger, thank you. And this is an area where you know, we really do have a lot in common. And I, I would once again point uh, to my colleague Jim Harper here in the audience, who I think more than anyone else has explained that, that privacy law in that area was stillborn because the court really misinterpreted subsequently its 1967 Katz decision and, and, and uh, developed the third party doctrine to say that if you store an electronic file on your computer, it's protected by the Fourth Amendment. If you store it on someone else's computer, it's not. I, I think that th that doctrine has just been fundamentally misapplied. And if you, to, to be very specific about how the doctrine would have d developed differently, if, if the court had, if subsequent courts had not um, taken Justice Harlan's one justice concurrence where he said, you know, use the term reasonable expectations of privacy and turn that into the test. And instead, it looked at what the, the sixth justice uh, majority actually said, which was to say that that, that which someone tries to keep private can be considered private. I, I think you would have gotten to something like Warshock actually decades ago. You would never have needed ECPA, and you would not be in this problem of having uh, Congress attempt to guess what the future is going to look like. And so I would just point you to, to Jim's excellent uh, brief in the, in the Jones case. Uh, Justice Sotomayor opened the door to, many of the, to much of this reconsideration. And I'd also point you to his article against the third party doctrine. Maybe the word you're looking for is resilient. More That's resilient precisely than... right. <laughs> this is a wonderful example of how developing law based on constitutional principles would have been far more resilient than the very brittle model of ECPA. Okay, so uh, we have time for a few more questions. Uh, yes. Carl Zabo with NetChoice. I think often in these conversations we Focus on all the negatives, how people are losing privacy and all, and all the potential harm, the loss of our humanity was used earlier today. But I was hoping each one of you could give an example of how people choosing to give up some privacy has actually been a benefit over the past decade. 
So you're saying voluntarily informed giving up privacy or kind of like accidentally doing something on Facebook that then become... Voluntarily. Okay, voluntarily informed. This is why I'm so resistant to this notion of trade-off. I think people are actually careful about how they disclose personal information online and the subsequent re-disclosure in most circumstances is beyond their control. I mean, the best example here is Facebook. You know, even my teenage kids are careful about what they put online, and they're very open, but they're not going to put, you know, social security numbers and grades and stuff that they understand to be personal, because people, all people draw lines. But here's the problem. Yeah, they're your kids. Right. Well, that may be it. But, <laughs> but, but here's the problem. When Facebook changes the privacy settings on Facebook users, the settings that people have relied on, because they said, oh, well, what I post on my wall, only my friends will see. And Facebook says, well, no, actually, we want everyone to see that. And if you really want your friends only to see it, then you've got to go back in and fix it. It's not a trade-off that anybody's actually made. It's a decision that Facebook made about how to take its user data and make it more widely available to monetize that. So I really... Um, so you're saying there's no no, that's obviously not what I said. I said the problem here, the privacy problem, is not about the trade-offs that people make. The privacy problem is about the decisions that unregulated business makes with the personal information that it acquires. That's the real hard problem. People don't want to talk about it in Washington. I don't think you do. But these, but these are not trade-offs. Yeah, let me... Uh... No, it's a, good, it's a really good question, and I'll answer it honestly in the sense that I'll destroy my own argument. Um, I think uh, that is a good question, and I, um, you know, whatever Adam says, I'm not actually against a lot of this new technology. I think one of the interesting things that all this technology oh, does... Yeah, if I can interrupt, uh, actually, uh, this is your book, and in fact, I think this is... Is this your Twitter screen name on yeah, the cover of your book? <laughs> yeah. A way to promote your use of the new technology. Isn't that second. horribly hip hypocritical? <laughs> I am the ultimate digital narcissist. And, and this comes back to your question. I think what it does, which is, and this perhaps touches on Adam's question of, you know, are we going to have censorship because we're all going to be Churchill or FDR and we won't leave our real legacies to the world. The really interesting culture, I'm not really, as you can tell, I'm not really a legal scholar like the other guys, so I can't talk about the nuts and bolts of legal issues, but I can talk broadly about culture. And I think what it's doing is, firstly, it's encouraging people to lie about themselves, which I think is a good thing, because it enables them to be creative. It enables people to build more coherent and thoughtful narratives of their own life and their own identity and shape them according to the way in which other people think about them. So it adds complexity and subtlety to our notions of identity. I think all those things are good. However, there's always a sting in the tail. I think that's only good for perhaps 1% or 2% of people online who have the education and sophistication to understand that. So what you're going to see in this new digital world is, 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 is one or two percent of people who are incredibly sophisticated and subtle managers of their own data. And that's going to be the, the, one of the most interesting, that's the new digital divide. That's going to be one of the most interesting distinctions between people who are able to manipulate their own data for their own benefit and their own legacy, to make them perhaps the Churchills and FDRs of the 21st century, where privacy and publicness have become the same thing. But for everybody else, I, I don't think they'll have the education, the creativity, the ability to actually do those things. But it's a really good question, and it's a fair question. Let's take two more questions uh, from the audience, if you could. OK. I, please go ahead. There's not another question. Uh, that It's the same rationale we heard for why we needed to regulate on online safety issues. People are sheep. People are stupid. They're not going to get it. They're not going to understand. They don't know how to do this. They don't know how to configure a filter. They don't know how to turn off a television or do whatever else. I'm sorry, you know, I think uh, I flip that around. I say we should expect that people take some steps to be responsible. You know, 850 million plus people, whatever it is now on Facebook, I'm sure a lot of them don't understand what they're doing there. I'm sure a lot of them are making really silly mistakes. And Brooke, put your hands over your ears. You know, I I'm a Facebook resistor for these reasons. I don't like it and I try to steer my kids away from it. It's a digital nudist colony. You know, I mean, you go there and reveal your entire self to the world. And I'm not a fan of that. But I take steps for myself and more for my family to deal with it. And I talk to my kids about it. I don't say, you're too stupid. You're never going to understand this. 
We need the government to come in and wipe your noses. You know, I'm sorry. There's a different way of looking at the world, and I, I prefer one, the other. One more point briefly. Uh, the, the other key lesson of the parental controls debate is that we didn't just uh, give uh, a tool that was really hard to use to parents and say, here, figure it out for yourselves. Instead, we created uh, an ecosystem where parents could rely on trusted third parties who would do this for them. So, so uh, in fact, you know, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not against helping people. I don't think that's always paternalism. I, I think that what it's, it's a false choice here to say that we have to choose between the, um, the radically empowered individual, which of course Andrew is going to say is never going to happen, and I would tend to largely to agree with him, and a government solution. And instead, what I want to do is have a world where, where we build better tools for users to make decisions, but understand that, that the best way for those tools to work is for intermediaries to get involved. And one, one of the things that Mark asked me about was about mandating that companies describe their privacy practices. I think the best way to do that is to make transparency um, uh, assist in, in choice. And that means to say that if you use structured disclosures, so you, you for instance, it could be as simple as uh, what SEAL program does this app on your mobile phone um, uh, participate in? The, the more you do that, the more you allow uh, the users of those phones to actually outsource those choices to trusted third parties, whether it be trustee or, or Epic. So, in other words, when, when we argue here, we're arguing for a model that includes many layers, and, and part of that is technological innovations that empowers users to let other people make choices uh, for them, but the important thing is that they're making those choices and not government. I mean, I think Adam's point's an interesting one because I think it reflects both the strength and the weakness of your argument. In, in, in a world where there isn't much legislation, you're going to have incredibly responsible parents like Adam who has essentially become government of his own family and decided that his kids shouldn't be on Facebook. And no doubt they will grow up to be very responsible, coherent, happy individuals. But the reality is that most people aren't like Adam. Most people aren't very responsible, engaged uh, parents. So it's all very well to say, well, I can do this, can't everybody else? The reality is most people aren't as serious parents as people like Adam or myself, for that matter. National nanny model is what you're basically now, saying. Now we're debating parenting styles. Do we have any other questions? Uh, anyone else from the audience? Uh, I see. Uh, uh, actually, in the, in yes, in the in the back, uh, Brad, you've already had your chance. I apologize. Tom Sidner. Uh, quick question. Um, I, I, actually, Baron, I'm interested in, in learning a little bit more about your thoughts on the FTC sort of providing more guidance outside of the context of, adjudica of adjudication, what exactly do you think would be, would be helpful for, for them to do uh, in that space? Doesn't, you, you don't seem to be, you, yeah. not reports, not, not necessarily adjudication, what they, would, what would they, they do? Very concretely today, what the FTC does is it, it brings compl complaints, the complaints describe the facts, and then they have a sentence or two about what they allege, uh, how they allege they have satisfied their legal authority. Because I mean, that, that is what a well-pleaded comp complaint is. Anybody who's going to sue doesn't explain their whole theory. And the problem is that those things never get before a court. So the FTC is never called to explain this. And we never get a legal decision that actually walks through the analysis. So what I'm saying is what, what I want Congress maybe to require the FTC to do is to, in its consent decrees, essentially go through the sort of analysis that a court would go through which is to develop doctrine, to say, you know, here's what, the, what our policy statements require. In deception, it has to be, there has to be deception, it has to be material. For unfairness, there has to be injury, no countervailing benefit, and can't be avoidable by, by you know, consumers reasonably. Explaining those things on a case-by-case -case basis would help to build law. And then going forward, if you, if you issue do, uh, guidelines, just as the FTC does in antitrust, you would essentially create a summary of, of what the FTC thinks the law is that people could look to. And that would provide the best and most resilient form of guidance to innovators, better than any sort of regulation or legislation could. Let me add one concrete thing that the FTC does today, I think it's very constructive and very helpful, which is that they, they publish a report called Marketing Violent uh, Entertainment to Children. It basically goes out and it reviews what the voluntary rating uh, organization do and how good of a job they do in terms of enforcing their voluntary rating systems. This would be music, movies, and of course video games. And they actually hire secret shoppers to go into like shopping malls or online and try to figure out if they can, as an underage buyer, get access to material that you're not supposed to be able to get access to under these voluntary rating systems. The FTC reviews this, they compile a big report, they publish it, and they shame certain industry folks into doing a better job, and they have been. The numbers have been increasing across the board for movie, music, and video games for many, many years now. 
At the end of the day, though, let's be clear, the FTC also knows it doesn't have authority to go far beyond that because they are operating in the shadow of the First Amendment. Um, and that's a big distinguishing factor between this and privacy. But they could use that same model for privacy, and in some ways you're starting to see that with the multi-stakeholder model in some ways. Well, we, we've reached kind of an interesting moment in this debate because I think Barron and Adam are both uh, enthusiastically endorsing the FTC's role in protecting consumer privacy, which, you know, is great. I mean, uh, I, I'm somewhat more skeptical, but first of all, with respect to, to Barron's point, you know, if you look at the settlements where you have not only the consent order but the findings of fact and the press release and the aid to facilitate public comment, there's a lot there. I mean, you'll find, I think, what you're looking for. A lot of those complaints that the FTC has pursued are actually based on materials that, that um, you know, Epic had, had put together. But here's where I think we're maybe still disagreeing about the role of the FTC. I don't think they need to provide the public with more information. If you want principles, you know, I think you'll find those in the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights. What I think the FTC needs to do right now is actually enforce its orders. That's the issue that Epic has pursued in the past year. Our view is at the end of 2011 with the Google, Facebook, and Twitter settlements, they had actually gone quite far and we said, wow, there are frameworks for, in their words, comprehensive privacy programs for three of the largest internet firms in the world. But then they wouldn't enforce the orders. When Facebook introduced Timeline and suddenly a lot of old data started appearing or when Google consolidated its privacy policies on March 1st and suddenly the data you were providing wasn't just to be used for email but for everything that Google was offering. Those were substantive changes that we felt violated the consent orders that the FTC had entered into with those companies. So I guess my question kind of pressing Barron a little bit as, as we end our discussion, and as I said, it's not a bad thing that you're um, a fan of, of the FTC, but at a certain point, it's really not about guidance, right? Isn't it really about the enforcement of, of some of these privacy rights the FTC has identified? Well, just to be clear, I am skeptical of the FTC, too. It is another bureaucracy. It's never going to be perfect, so I, I don't want to call myself an enthusiast, but I do think that in terms of making the best with what we have, I, I think it's, it is, it is a, a reasonably good model that can work in conjunction with other, uh, other things. It is an important layer in the layered approach that I would defend. And I would generally agree with you that, that it is a problem that the FTC doesn't enforce, but I would say that the problem is actually more general, that the FTC doesn't enforce not just because of a lack of political will, but because it doesn't, it doesn't know how to, when to, it doesn't have clear doctrines. I mean, the, there is a chasm right now. If you imagine a pyramid on antitrust, the pyramid is complete. You have the statute at the top, you have uh, guidelines in the middle, you have litigated actual decisions, and then you have flowing from that, you can work your way up and you understand how everything works. On the consumer protection side, at least in the area of privacy, you have the statute, you have the two policy statements from 1980 and 1983, <laughs> You have a gap. There is nothing in the middle that explains how these things work between that and the consent decrees. And what I'm saying is going forward, one of the problems in enforcing these sort of consent decrees is precisely that the FTC doesn't have a clear doctrine to point to. It's not just explanation, it's actually building what I say in the, in the most general sense is uppercase L law. It is resilient. It's what I think is the best thing to deal with privacy problems in the future when government actually needs to intervene. Uh, but, well, let me ask, ask us, do we, do we have time for any more questions? Uh, one more question from the audience, what do you think? Uh, I, I, perhaps one very short question. Okay, pressure's on. I saw your hand up. Uh. Thanks. Uh, Stephen Balkan with the Family Online Safety Institute. Panel, do you think the Do Not Track Kids Act, as perceived by Marky and Barton, and particularly the eraser button, is a good or not such a great idea? That's a short question. I, I think it's a good idea in general. I mean, it's not perfect, and there are other things we would do, but I think it, it should be passed rather than not. Go back to the statement I made a moment ago that... Uh, not every uh, complex social problem can be solved with uh, a silver bullet type solution. It's a good idea that we take steps to limit information about kids and where it flows, but the Marky Barton bill has a lot of problems, and especially because it's going to butt up against First Amendment values at some point. Yeah, in, in particular, Adam and I spent a lot of time explaining why the COPPA model in general really only works up until about the age of 13. And if you expand it beyond that to cover teenagers, you run into really significant First Amendment problems. I think that that's a point that's just not well understood in Washington. 
excuses for not legislating. Right? Yeah, the, the, the so-called First Amendment dismissed here by our friend from across the pond. Okay, okay. now we're arguing U.S. versus U.K. Let's give these folks a round of applause. Uh, thank you for coming. Likewise, thank you.